Scott's going to talk a little bit about this uh, first game that was played in uh, Johnson's Island. It was, I think, but he'll talk about what its significance is in history and so forth. And then John and myself and Jim and a few others from the Frogs and other groups were going to get together on March the 15th. We'll go up there and lay out the field and find out all about how we're going to play that game and what uniforms to wear and so forth. So, John, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, Vicki just left, and I'm, I'm sorry she uh, she did. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, you know, there may be uh, some question about who was first, the old Beth Page folks or the Muffins, but uh, there's no question about uh, who has been the ambassadors for the vintage game in America. If you check any team you can find in the country, virtually any team, and check their genealogy, their roots would come right back here to this Muffin program. No question. It's a pleasure for me to be back here and, uh, and see so many familiar faces, some old faces. There's <laughs> <laughs> some new ones too. The, uh, uh, the greatest part of vintage baseball for me when I was active with the Frogs was uh, the places we got to go and the people we met and we had uh, no better friends than a muffin source. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, we're going to have a ball game this summer. I don't think it's really important. Is it? It's not long. Okay. Sound like it's on to me. Hit the volume on. Testing, testing. Any better? No. Position. Boss, right? Sign the card for Richard Church. If not, raise your hand and we'll send it along. Just keep it. Thank you. Okay. Well, they're, they're the name of an old friend of the frogs. One of my, uh, I told this story already, but one of my greatest memories uh, uh, early on, we had some uh, differences about how to play the game and, and what rules were and what we should be playing by. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, I thought was a part of the early game was stealing bases. And, uh, of course, the muffins didn't permit that. One day out here on a muffin meadow, the frogs were playing the muffins. Dick Shrake was the umpire, and I decided, boy, here's my chance. I'm on first base. I'm going to do it. So I go down to second base, and he's over there with his, taking a little nip out of his game, like he does, you know. <laughs> Mr. Hossman, you're out of the ball game. You find me a quarter, call me out, true me. <laughs> oh, never forget that for that. Uh, we're going to have a ball game this summer, and we're going to we're going to play on uh, on Johnson's Island. We're going to be the guests up there, the uh, the friends and descendants of Johnson's Island, which is a, an organization that has done an awful lot to uh, preserve the history of the the prison that was on that island under the tutelage of Dr. Uh, David Bush at the uh, University of Tiffin. Uh, archaeology has been on the island has been uh, his life's work. Uh, the foundation there has uh, purchased a good part of the prison uh, to preserve it, and uh, uh, they're they're really uh, uh, supporting this blog. And before I went any further, the way this came about a year ago, a year and a half ago at the uh, Saber Convention, Society for American Baseball Research Convention in Minneapolis. Uh, Jim Toodle, here's Jim Toodle, threw, threw this idea at me. It took me about two seconds to say, boy, that's a great idea. You've got to try and pull this off. So I took Jim's idea and uh, talked to Dr. Bush at Tiffin University and subsequently met with their board a couple of times and uh, 
Uh, and they're supporting the game and they're throwing uh, everything they've got behind it. And uh, uh, we're, to, we're to be there on August uh, 24th as, uh, as their guest and stage a game as much as we can make it like the one that was played there exactly 150 years earlier. Uh, so with that, uh, for today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I know about how baseball was played on Johnson's Island uh, about 150 years ago. And I'd also like to uh, uh, talk a little bit when I'm done with that about, uh, in general, what our game might look like. I first presented some of these thoughts uh, on Johnson's Island Baseball to the uh, Society for American Baseball Research Annual Convention uh, in 2004, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I drew a couple of conclusions then that I uh, told the group about. And one was that uh, uh, the old saw is that the uh, game of baseball spread during the Civil War because the Northern soldiers carried it throughout out the country and taught it to uh, the southern uh, southern boys that didn't know anything about baseball, uh, especially in prison camps. Uh, part of my talk was uh, that, uh, at least in one case, that on Johnson's Island, there were prisoners inside those walls that were experienced baseball players and knew far more about the game of baseball than the, uh, the, pri the uh, Ohio soldiers that were guarding them. And the other point that I made was that I believe this was the first game that was played by New York rules, the Knickerbocker rules as, as we know them, in the state of Ohio between two clubs. I said this 10 years ago and uh, neither has been refuted. Uh, there's been a lot of research done and we can talk a little bit about that later. So uh, this, this I, these two ideas have been around for some time. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, at this point tell you what I know about the game on the island itself. Uh, we all know, and, we, and we've experienced it ourselves, that there are uh, a number of myths and falsehood and uh, fairy tales uh, concerning our game of baseball, and, and many of them have their roots uh, within the Civil War. Uh, the most colossal of all these uh, was perpetrated by a commission called the Mills Commission in 1907 that suggested that this man was the inventor of baseball. Anybody know who that is? <laughs> That's a good old Abner, uh, but absolutely nothing to do with baseball. Uh, but uh, debunking that uh, farce is kind of like trying to debunk Santa Claus. Many people still think that's, uh, that's how, how the game uh, came about. Uh, a little bit of, about the prison itself. Uh, Johnson's Island is located uh, off Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, I love using this thing. This is Johnson's Island right here in Sandusky Bay. Uh, Sandusky is down here. Uh, here's Cedar Point right over here for reference. And of course, Cleveland's over to the east uh, and Toledo to the west. But that's, uh, that's the island itself right there. Now here's, a, here's another uh, drawing of the island that uh, shows what it looked like uh, uh, at the time it was a prison, and you can see where I pirated this off the internet. Uh, but I, I get any credit. But this area right in here is the stockade itself. Over here is the guard barracks, administration buildings, uh, things of that sort. And then the city of uh, Sandusky would be down at the bottom of the, out, uh, the, the, bottom of the map there. Uh, the, the prison uh, was in operation from uh, 1862 until the end of the war. Usually there were about 2,500 prisoners in there. Uh, it was designed specifically for Confederate officer prisoners. Uh, and during the course of the war, about 10,000 officers passed through there, uh, including seven general officers. Uh, hmm. The thing that we have is a great advantage as far as research and knowing what went on there. The men that were in there were the most, some of the most highly educated men in the South. Uh, they were literate, well-read, uh, they made a written record, and most of what I'm going to talk to you about today comes from those primary sources, the written record, the people that were there and saw events made. So it's, it's primary stuff, and for that reason, I apologize in advance as we go along. I'm going to, I'm going to do uh, quite a bit of reading, but I want you to get it just like they, they wrote it down. Uh, 
I uh, mentioned it was, excuse me, I'm trying to get the lay of the land here, uh, intended for, for officer prisoners only, but uh, take a look at this chart. This is a snapshot from one day, February 1st, 1864, the year of the game we're going to play, of giving a breakdown of the uh, categories of prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, most of, of course, are Confederate officers, but uh, there's several privates in there. We'll learn about one of those a little later. Uh, some citizens, uh, notably some spies, they put spies in there, and some Negroes. Uh, uh, several cases of uh, uh, attendants or servants that uh, went along with their officers hmm. early in the war. Uh, so that's who was in there. Uh, moving along to uh, baseball now, the good part. Uh, some, some weeks before the 27th day of August in 1864, uh, the Confederate Baseball, formerly organized club in the prison, issued a challenge to the Southern Baseball Club for a match. Both the clubs were made up of Confederate officers, and uh, uh, the Southern Club did accept, accept the challenge, and uh, the, the date was set. Uh, and the excitement of this proposed match uh, just grew like wildfire, and it was uh, spread so fast and far that uh, by the time the game date arrived and the game happened, there were 3,000 people watching. Granted, 2,500 people or so were inside, but uh, all the Union Guard forces that could watch it, and there were a number of people from the uh, city of Sandusky that came out, came out to watch the game from nearby rooftops. No kidding. I mentioned the uh, written record, which is invaluable to us in knowing what went on there. And uh, this is the part where I'm going to start to read a little bit, but I'd uh, like you to listen very carefully because uh, what I'm going to read now are the accounts of men that were there and participated in or saw this grand mass that was played on August 27th, 1864. Uh, Lieutenant Michael McNamara the 7th Louisiana in Infantry wrote, they organized baseball clubs, two words, the Southern Nine composed of those below the rank of captain of which Charlie Pierce was captain and catcher, you'll hear about Pierce again, and the Confederate Nine composed of higher officers. Their championship game was considered one of the finest ever played and witnessed by upwards of 3,000 people including prisoners, officers, and citizens of Sandusky, Ohio, who eagerly embraced the opportunity to be present. <coughs> First-hand account. A Colonel Daniel Robinson of the Alabama 31st Infantry. This is his uh, diary of the day of the game. The great excitement today has been about the match game of baseball between the, the Southern and Confederate baseball clubs. The former having for their colors white shirts and the latter red shirts. That's something we're going to have to decide. We're going to be in uniform for this game. The game was a very spirited nine innings and won by the white shirts. During the progress of the game, nearly all the prisoners looked on with eager interest and bets were made freely among those who had the necessary cash. That has changed. Uh, men had the necessary cash and who were given to such practices. And very soon, the crowd was pretty equally divided between the partisans of the white shirts and those of the red shirts. And a real rebel yell went up from one side or the other at every success of their chosen colors. The Yankees themselves, outside the prison yard, seemed to be not indifferent spectators, indifferent spectators to the game, but crowded the housetops and looked on with as much interest as did the rebels themselves. Another account from uh, Lieutenant William Peel of the 11th Mississippi Infantry. Uh, Peel was there for that game in, uh, in uh, August of uh, 1864, and he's one of those that died on the island. But the following winter, he died of pneumonia. Uh, there has been for several weeks a challenge pending over one of the baseball clubs. The Confederate <coughs> challenged the Southern Club. The game came off today and created more excitement than anything has done in the yard for a long time. There were several hundred dollars bet on the, by the clubs and outsiders. 
They played nine innings. The Southerners beat the Confederates very badly. The round standing 19 to 11. Uh, still another account for that, some more, uh, more detail. Lieutenant Edmund Patterson, also of Alabama. The match game between the Confederate Baseball Club and the Southern Baseball Club took place this evening, resulting in a brilliant victory on the part of the Southern Club. The first innings were won by the Confederate Club, and they made a run of three. The first innings of the Southern Club amounted to nothing. The Confederates led until the fifth innings when the Southern took it from them and maintained it throughout. The sympathies and the good wishes of the crowd were decidedly with the Southern Club from the commencement. At the close of the game, the scorers <coughs> reported as follows. Confederate Club 11, Southern Club 19. Another game is expected next Saturday. Among the sporting characters, a considerable amount of money changed hands. <laughs> not only do we have primary sources, but they seem to agree. You're hearing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, uh, numerous other accounts of the, the game, uh, in addition to these four, uh, between these two organized clubs, but they also mentioned at least two other games that were played between these two clubs. Uh, no doubt that uh, baseball was an important part of the life on Johnson's Island, and I have several other references to a more casual play that went on over the life of the prison. Uh, I could identify all these by person, but it wouldn't mean much to you, but I'll tell you the dates so you can see that throughout the life of the prison, baseball was played there casually and in this uh, uh, club set. Uh, from uh, June of 1862, I had got a ball for the purpose of playing a game with it every day. Uh, July of 1864, uh, this is one of Morgan's Raiders that uh, visited us here in Ohio and ended up in Johnsonville. Uh, he said, in the evening I played my first game of baseball, having just joined the Confederate Baseball Club of the prisoners confined here. Very much pleased. He said in another entry a few days later, commenced a game of baseball before breakfast. The day got too warm to finish it after breakfast. After supper, we played ball again. Uh, another, uh, a member of one of the ball clubs hollered for the club to turn out. All the, all the Yanks made for their guns. Such fools. Uh, Prisoners, the prisoners nearly every inning, this is in, uh, again, 1864 in the summer, are engaged in the game they call baseball, which notwithstanding the heat, they prosecute with pers persevering energy. I don't understand the game, but those who play it get very much excited over it. That <laughs> appears to be fine exercise. Uh, Peel again, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the chap that uh, died on the island of pneumonia, uh, said later, uh, there came near being a serious accident in the yard this evening. There was a party engaged in a game of baseball. The man at the bat struck with all his might, but the missed ball and the bat, a very large heavy one, flew out of his hands and struck Captain Fellows, who stood a few feet from him, plumped in the forehead. But the captain uttered a low exclamation. They threw up both his hands and staggered and would have fallen to the ground, but was caught by a gentleman near him. He lay quite insensible for several minutes, but bathing his head at length revived him. The square end of the paddle struck him and consequently left no cut, but his head was badly bruised. Leaning on the shoulders of a couple of his friends, he walked after a while to his block. Uh, tough for Captain Fellows, but it does point out that uh, when these games were played, uh, it was interest to spectators as well, so they drew a crowd. Uh, still another from, uh, this is from 1865, uh, May 12, 1865, near the end of the war. Uh, a match game of baseball was played by the Southerners and the Confederate baseball clubs. The playing was different, but the Southerners gained a complete and easy victory, scoring 27 runs and nine innings, while the Confederates scored only 11. Uh, a footnote in, a, in another diary, uh, a transcribed diary, suggested that each of the batters, there were 13 there, 
uh, had a club. So again, uh, baseball was a big part of the prison life there, and the form of the organized game, as we can see from uh, from uh, several of these accounts, went on for a long period of time. Uh, in addition to the written word, uh, we have uh, have uh, an expression of baseball uh, in art form. This is a drawing, and I don't know how well you can see that, but that's a, a drawing made by a private, uh, one of the one of the, one of the enlisted men over there. Uh, and the, the buildings are two rows of well, six buildings at the top, and then there's a another one the, to the right. Those are the prisoners' barracks, and there's a stockade around around the uh, the whole affair. There's great detail on this map. Lake Erie is the bottom. There's a dusky bay. Uh, it's really quite a Quite a good drawing, and it's uh, very, very much detailed. And you can't see it, but I'm going to pull it this, this section right here, I'm going to blow up so you can see what that says. Playing based. Playing based. Mm -hmm. And I think based is just a, a, a different word for a might have been, might have been, uh, might have been what you call baseball. But if you look carefully, you see nine little figures around there, and one of them's got a bat. So we've got a visual form and documentation of uh, baseball being played there in Iowa. This was done in the fall, October of uh, 1863, before this big game we're talking about. Uh, but again, it shows that throughout the life of the prison, uh, baseball was played there. Shortly after uh, this drawing was dated, about a month, Private Kearns was uh, shipped out to another prison. He would uh, stay there. For the duration. Uh, as as I've, I've said several times, throughout the course of the war, baseball was played there. But the references, especially to the formal game, uh, are really concentrated in the summer of 1864, which might seem a little odd because uh, conditions in the prison really deteriorated from when it was opened in 1862 initially. Our prisoners were allowed uh, mail, uh, uh, unlimited uh, express packages. They received food. There was a sutler that came in daily. Prisoners that had the wherewithal to, to make purchases could buy, buy fresh food, uh, virtually anything from the sutler. Uh, they really, it was a pretty cushy prison early in the war. Uh, getting on to about 1864, <coughs> People in the North started hearing things about Libby Prison in the Andersonville. Uh, conditions changed. Uh, rations were cut back. Uh, rules were strictly enforced. Uh, we have accounts in 1864 of prisoners chilling and eating rats. Uh, food was so short. Uh, so why then, when things are getting so bad, would baseball take off and become more popular and these formal clubs be before? Uh, I think the answer to this was who was in, within those prison walls at the time. Uh, fighting in Virginia on November 7th, 1863, back to the war, as part of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was the Louisiana 7th Infantry, known as the Pelican Regiment, a part of the famous Louisiana Tigers. This regiment, along with the other Confederate unions, was overwhelmed that day at Rappahannock Station, and more than 50 officers from Louisiana, many from New Orleans, were taken as prisoners of war. Among them was the previously mentioned Lieutenant Charlie Pierce, who finally broke his sword over his knee and handed the, handed the hilt to his Yankee captain. Pierce and his fellow officers were incarcerated at Johnson's Island, arriving there on November 11, 1863. Understanding the Civil War units were raised geographically, it is no surprise that many of these officers would have lived each other and known each other before the war. Among these men were baseball players who had played together before the war, uh, so it may not be a coincidence that the game took off at the time it did because of the influx of experienced baseball players. Baseball clubs were organized, and this is something I had no idea <coughs> most people didn't, were organized as early as 1859 in New Orleans, and matches, uh, intra club matches, matches between two clubs were played as early as 1859. 
the Louisiana Baseball Club was the first, and the announcement of New Orleans' third club, the Southern Baseball Club, that's all familiar? The Southern mm -hmm. Baseball Club, the same name as we had on the island, came in August. Mm -hmm. By the summer of 1860, there were nine clubs competing for the city championship. Nine formally organized clubs in the Deep South before the Civil War. I had no idea. Did a, did a study and uh, it had some help in doing this. We're looking at uh, pre-war Louisiana newspapers and uh, looking at, uh, at box scores uh, and game accounts. And I did this uh, before I first presented this uh, work uh, 10 years ago. And I found 10 surnames in the Louisiana papers associated with baseball uh, that were duplicated on Jansen's Island uh, August 27th, 1864. Now, they're all common names, and they're not identified uh, uh, in the newspaper except by the surname. Because I think there's a reasonable possibility, or I did at that time, that uh, some of those chaps could be the ones on the island. They, and there were names uh, uh, Edward Ryan, uh, Seventh Louisiana in Industry, uh, William Sims, Eighth Louisiana Infantry. Captain S.F. Wall, Louisiana Cavalry, 9th, uh, 9th Brigade, and from the Empire Baseball Club, uh, Thomas Harris. It seemed to me that uh, that would, although not definitive, that some of those guys, if not all of them, would, would be the same ones from the ball club that were on the island. Uh, since that early study uh, I first presented, evidence has been found supporting the theory that the players from organized Louisiana clubs were, in fact, involved with uh, baseball on the island. Uh, another member of uh, SABA, the Society for American Ball Research, uh, Dr. Bruce Aldice of Illinois, discovered a feature story uh, on the history of the Southern Baseball Club in a January 23, 1870, New Orleans Republic newspaper. The story not only traces uh, the history of uh, the Southern Baseball Club, but it tells a little bit about its activities on, uh, on Johnson's Isle. Uh, and I'll read again from the uh, newspaper of 1870, talking about the Southern Baseball Club. Some of, the, some of the members who were as prisoners of war to beguile the tedious hours of confinement organized at the lower end of the prison the Southern Club of Johnson's Isle. Howard Wright, then lieutenant of the 20th Louisiana, as president, the same position he filled with the club in New Orleans. John Rowan, the lieutenant of the 7th Louisiana, vice president, and Edward Ryan, who I mentioned as one of my four suspects earlier, also a lieutenant in the 7th Louisiana, was captain. In opposition to the Southerns, there was organized at the upper end of the prison the Confederate Club. Embracing on his role such names as General Trimble, Generals Miles and Thompson, and Colonel J. O. Nixon. Lieutenant Roselle from Nashville was their captain. And later in the story, it identified several players that played for the uh, uh, Southern Club in the Grand Mass that we're, we're talking about today. The first base was guarded by G. W. Money of Alabama. Well, the second base was taken care of by Lieutenant Flaker Kent of the 16th Louisiana Infantry. Ed Ryan again pitched, and here he is again, the Prince of Catchers. Lieutenant Charlie Pierce was behind the bat. So that little bit that uh, Dr. Allardyce found for us in that 1870 picture, uh, 70 newspaper leaves no doubt the players from Louisiana experienced ball players, club baseball players from Louisiana, were in the prison uh, at the time of this big game and participated in. Uh, another chap I'd like to talk about is uh, this man, Lieutenant or, or Colonel uh, David Huntley. David Huntley was quite a guy. He was from Alabama, educated in the North, got a law degree at uh, Harvard and practiced law in Chicago. He was there when the when the war broke out. Uh, when that happened, he went back home. Uh, 
and enlisted or whatever a colonel does. He uh, had a regiment, so he was a, a really committed guy uh, for this cause. But he left Chicago to do that. Uh, and a bit about, we, we talk about New York City as being the birthplace of the game as we know it, the Knickerbocker game, uh, which in fact it was. But it spread to Chicago very quickly, and that's where Huntley was. Uh, Huntley wrote uh, an early account that I wrote to you previously, and he knew about baseball, or he knew enough about it to write about it. Uh, baseball was well established in Chicago by 1857, and New York uh, rules, the same rules that we're talking about, uh, were the order of the day there. Uh, the baseball match games have been played in Illinois since the early 1850s. The first Chicago Club, the Union, wasn't established until 1856. Uh, the first uh, Chicago City Championship was contested in 1859, just a year before New Orleans. Uh, so baseball was uh, very well established in Chicago when Huntley was there. And whether or not he played baseball himself, I don't know. Uh, but his pre-war diaries uh, don't tell anything about it. But he used terms in his writing, uh, if you can recall what I read, like match game, clubs, spectators. He knew about nine inning game lengths. He knew about uniforms. He knew about betting. Uh, and I do know that he was involved in post-war baseball in Atlanta. Uh, so just another case of a person who, again, not definitively, but most probably knew about baseball when he went in there. Uh, probably a lot more than, than our chaps in Ohio knew about. Uh, Hey, John? Yes. Do you have any explanation on, on why the baseball was, was going on in Chicago, going on in New Orleans, places like that, prior to Ohio? Well, I think probably because uh, they were large urban centers. New Orleans in 1860 was the sixth largest city in the country. I don't know where Chicago stood, but they're both centers of commerce and trade. Uh, in New Orleans and uh, New York, both huge ports. I think it was just uh, the movement of people uh, among those areas. Uh, the uh, the uh, enlisted guards at Johnson's Island from northern Ohio wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to get around like they did, I don't think. I, that would be my, my <coughs> Let me do that ten. Uh, <coughs> One of the other things I like to talk about is the uh, fact that this uh, may have been the first game in Ohio played by New York rules in between, uh, between the two different clubs. I've done uh, uh, quite a bit of looking around the state of Ohio, and I did this before uh, 2004 uh, to see if I could find a match game that was earlier. And I've got uh, several accounts here, but I'll just mention one that was uh, let me see if I can find it here. There, was, there were clubs in Sandusky and Toledo in 1860, but again, they played just in a mural game. Uh, Cincinnati, we found uh, uh, several early games, but it was town ball or Massachusetts baseball. Uh, Columbus, uh, some guy named Toodle wrote a book, a baseball <laughs> in Columbus, and he said the game of baseball arrived in Columbus in the early spring of 1866, after our time, with nearly the simultaneous formation of three amateur clubs, the Buckeyes, Capitals, and Excelsior. Uh, so there, I found a number of references to uh, baseball before the war, but none with uh, the New York game first and, and between two clubs. Uh, so there's nothing, nothing I could find in the papers until recently. There's something that's kind of tantalizing. Uh, the New York Clipper has an account of a match game described as baseball at Oberlin uh, that was played on July 16, 1860. This was four years before our time. The paper reported the score as a railroad club 49, uptown club 44. Now, I've got several questions about that. It's a town ball like score, uh, and there were eight players on the side, and I checked the date of the game. It was played on a Tuesday. Uh, so I. It's a possibility that game would predate ours on Johnson's Island, but I'm not thoroughly convinced. But uh, 
I, th I think uh, a game could be discovered one day that would uh, predate the one we're talking about. And, and I intend to take a look at this game and see if that might be it. And continue to look for others. And, and other people are doing the same. But uh, just between you and me, I'm not going to look too hard before our game in August. I think uh, just uh, a note about Charlie. I think he's here. We got a picture of him. A uh, picture in uniform on the left, and, uh, and it's a really pose on the right. Uh, Charlie was quite a guy. He was uh, born in Cincinnati. Uh, got involved. His dad was a, uh, a riverboat captain and applied the trade between Cincinnati and New Orleans. And I think that's how we got. Uh, involved with the Southern cause, uh, caused a great deal of division in his own family, but he had two brothers join uh, uh, the Confederate cause. Uh, one lost a leg and one lost his life. <coughs> Charlie, uh, Charlie made it out alive. He was one of the last people to leave Jackson's Island. Uh, the prerequisite for getting out of there was you had to take an oath of allegiance to the United States. Uh, and he hesitated to do that, but was convinced that that's the only way to get out. So he finally did. Uh, as, I, as I said, he went back to uh, New Orleans, uh, or did I say, and he died of typhoid fever when he was 25 years old, two years later. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a guy, and I, kinda, I guess we might call him Ohio's first baseball hero. For a long time, I, he was the only player I knew that was involved in the game. And everybody spoke out of him in the world. Uh, you know, you've got to remember, though, that uh, this was a time of war, and a prisoner's life there was on Johnson Island was hard. Out of the most prisons, but it was still hard. The men were, that were there were forced to be in a place they didn't want to be, they were forced to be away from home and family, suffered from hunger, cold, loneliness, frustration, and disease, and were subject to being shot at any time, and some were. Over 200 didn't make it out alive. There's a cemetery on Johnson's Island. Mm -hmm. When you're up there, you can go visit. There's over 200 Confederate soldiers there in that, uh, that cemetery now. Uh, life on Johnson's Island was uh, not a lot of fun and games. Nonetheless, the men that were, uh, were there pursued our, our national pastime. As I said earlier, as the research never ends, the smash game that might supplant this one is the first one that uh, will, could be found someday, and I think uh, I think probably will. So going back to my original premise uh, that the game was uh, played there by experienced ball players at, uh, from the South to Tyler Northerners, I don't think there's there's any doubt about that. We've uh, we've got that nailed. The other half of the. Uh, the story about this being the first ball game in Ohio may not hold up much longer. Uh, that's it for the Genesis Island. Yeah. Question is, is is there room for us to play? Do we know for sure that there's room? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there? uh, there's a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> the uh, friends and descendants of Genesis Island has purchased a lot of this uh, uh, territory there, uh, almost all that stockade area. So we'll be able to play um, just about the spot where they were, where I showed you on the other cool. We'll be able to be right about on that spot. Uh, it's been cleared out. This is where most of the archaeology has been done. Sandy and I have been up there and done some digging, which is, if anybody can do that, it's really a, kind of a gas to, to uh, see where this was and uh, be able to participate in it. Uh, and when, when you dig, you're digging with a tree. That's where there's all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, <laughs> that's not what you would think. But, uh, but garbage was, was thrown into those, and uh, there were dumps, and uh, there were a lot of articles that were dropped in there, and left there for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, that now they can be How do you get to the island? There's a causeway. I showed you that there was a, the Marblehead Point. Uh, there's a causeway from there out to the island. You've got to pay a cost to get there. Uh, there will be some problems, uh, uh, and we're going to have to work these out, depending on the crowd. Uh, they've never had more than 100 people out there. Uh, I think we might have more than that for this. Uh, it, uh, there'll be some issues with parking and, 
and facilities and that sort of thing that we're going to have to work out, out as well. Board council. I may have missed this, but in the, in the game on the island, this, those were all southerners that were playing against each other. There were no Yankees playing. That's absolutely right. So it was all it was southerners showing the Yankees how to play baseball. You got my point. Thank gotcha. you. <laughs> no, you were paying attention. Exactly. There, were, there were no Yankee participants at all. It was all strictly no, no. southerners. These were formally organized baseball clubs, like the Knickerbockers were, uh, and they had uh, one the Confederate club had several generals, as I mentioned. Uh, they didn't play. They were a, an organized club, a social club, like the Knickerbockers were. And they had a first nine and a second nine, and that's what they did here. They put out their best nine to play this game against. They may have had a muffin nine. They had muffin nines, by the way, in Louisiana before the war. I've seen them a couple of times. Muffin nine is your worst nine. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. Hey. Hey. <laughs> what, what was uh, Johnson's Island used for after the camp was closed? Uh, it was farming and the, the timber was all taken off during the war uh, and there's a quarry there. Uh, it's been developed now and there's a number of housing developments out there uh, and uh, the homeowners association and friends of Johnson's Island are real good friends. Uh, there's a little class going on there. In fact, I read the account of, uh, of uh, townspeople being on the rooftop looking over the stockade to watch this game. Somebody thought that'd be a good idea. We'll just go over to the neighborhood, neighborhood next door and climb up on people's roofs and watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim mentioned uh, several of the muffins and the frogs and myself and uh, representatives of the friends and descendants of Johnson's Island are going to meet on the island next month on the 15th and look at the field and uh, uh, try and lay that out. And in addition to that, there are several things I think the clubs between them need to decide, like, who's going to be the white shirts and who's going to be the red shirts. Uh, uh, some equipment will need to be supplied. Supplied. We've got to do everything we can to make this as authentic as possible. Uh, I understand that uh, prisoners were discouraged and uh, from wearing uniform. Uh, they tried to demilitarize them as much as they could. Uh, but the order of the day would be any kind of period of pants, really. White shirts and red shirts. Uh, there are going to be two large reenactor groups there. Uh, one union that will act as union guards, and a Confederate uh, group that will be spectators. Uh, they're all excited about betting and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so the clubs have to decide who's going to be who. Uh, the only equipment that we would have uh, that I think would to keep it accurate would be bats, balls, and bases. Uh, bases, we need to come up with some uh, burlap bags or some, something that they could have uh, come up with within the prison. So some of the little details we'll have to talk about. Uh, but we want to make it look as much like it was as we possibly can. Uh, any other questions, Jim? Uh, send me this nice uh, uh, kind of press release that had already been put out about the game, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, we're definitely going to go ahead with this and have a nice uh, But it's, This was put out by the Friends and Descendants group, is that right? Well, I did that. They put it in their newsletter. and uh, yeah, That wasn't their newsletter, that copy you have there. Uh, they've got a guy, one of their reenactors, that uh, does publicity for their group routinely. He's pissed on another press release, and uh, the Friends are really taking a hard look at how much they should publicize this because of the lack of facilities out there. Uh, as I said, there's probably been not more than 100 people on that island at once in this area. And uh, we could draw that many other clubs. You know. uh, we'll see where it goes as far as that publicity. Uh, I think it could be a really big deal and a lot of people would be interested to see it, including news people. This, this will be on the 150th anniversary on the day. Three days off. Oh, I thought it was I initially said that, yeah. But oh, okay. The, game was, the, the game was on the 27th and we'll play on the 24th. Okay. Mm. okay. 
Pretty cool. Anybody else have any questions before we adjourn for the day? Yeah. I just want to, I just got confirmation. The General Trimble that you mentioned is actually an ancestor of a dear friend of mine. <coughs> so if we could work with getting him up there, maybe even play, it's I grandfather or something somewhere around the line. Do you know anything about Trimble? I don't personally, but <coughs> Dennis does. I his, believe he's got he has his general a uh, general's uniform. I believe he lost a leg at uh, Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg and was captured. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, uh, was it Tremble? Yeah. Tremble. And he was he was a member of the club. Obviously, yeah. I don't think he played. But I just made the confirmation. That would be yeah. Now so, somebody, Charlie, did you have the somebody had a? I my my mom my, my mom had an ancestor who was a guard. I don't. Was a guard, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Any of those connections we can make would really be neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tremble especially, you know, big deal they have a ten over there. They have seven. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.